Hi, this is Steve Platek for Evolution This View of Life, the magazine that approaches anything and everything from an evolutionary perspective. Today we're fortunate to be talking with Professor Simon Baron Cohen from Cambridge University. How are you doing, Simon? Hi, nice to see you on the on your interview. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so um, Simon, a couple of questions that I had for you. Uh, the, the first question I had was a question about modularity. Your work on autism is oftentimes put forth in the evolutionary psychological literature as um, excellent evidence for modularity. Um, and obviously there's a big debate about domain general, domain specific, modularity hypothesis. I wonder if you could just comment on, on modularity and, and how your work comes to play on that. Sure. I, I, I mean, I think that the strongest claims that have been made um, for modularity in the field I work in is uh, to do with theory of mind and that there might be a theory of mind module and a lot of the evidence came for that came from research into autism this neurological uh, disability uh, which seems to selectively impair theory of mind so these are kids who are delayed in the development of understanding other people's points of view and, uh, you know, it's tempting since autism itself is, is partly genetic. It's tempting to imagine that there might be um, genes that are important for the development of this capacity for, uh, for theory of mind or thinking about other people's minds. But, uh, you know, the strong notion of a module implies that it really is standalone, that it doesn't um, overlap or interact with other, other brain functions. And actually I think that uh, it's still too early to know if you can apply that very strong view of modularity. And you know, just some of the reasons why we might question that is that uh, theory of mind, uh, seem, it doesn't just switch on at a certain point in development, it grows like most aspects of development. It has its precursors. Some people say that uh, a kind of earlier step is joint attention where a typical child is able to follow where someone else is looking and um, uh, code other people's attention, focus of attention. So even before they can understand what someone else knows or thinks, they're already able to at least look at faces and um, take another perspective, at least in the visual sense, you know, imagine what someone else can see. Hmm. And that's already kind of broadening um, the developmental input into this system. It's not just about understanding people's thoughts, it's about looking at faces and maybe, um, you know, there's a social module, which is, uh, or maybe social input is very important for the development of the theory of mind module. But either way, it, it means it's not as clear cut, um, and we need we need more research. So, uh, is it safe to assume that uh, right now the evidence suggests there's a set of hierarchical models, all of which sort of develop um, uh, together or synchronously uh, during ontogeny, um, and that at any point, maybe maybe one of those steps, one of the links in that chain can be broken, as might be the case in autism? Yeah, I mean, those are all good hypotheses. Right. <laughs> I think the idea that there's a, a series of, of modules that are hierarchically organized, you know, itself is just a hypothesis. You know, I, 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 I particularly was interested in uh, something that enabled shared attention, uh, so I called that the shared attention mechanism, or SAM, uh -huh. uh, and it had a sort of sister module called the uh, intention detector. Uh, so it's a system for very rapidly coding somebody else's goal, um, mm. or, or what uh, what they're acting towards, and reading actions in intentional ways. But you know, these are these are in some ways getting more support from recent brain imaging from fMRI studies. Uh, Rebecca Sachs's work at MIT, for example, is uh, picking out particular brain regions like uh, right TPJ mm -hmm. for, for shared attention and ventromedial prefrontal cortex seems to be very involved in uh, theory of mind. 
But uh, again, it's still a long way from saying these are pure modules. Um, and, you know, how they interact with other, other brain systems like language, uh, like attachment. Mm. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's still a lot of scope for interaction between these systems. Fantastic. I have to ask this question because um, I'm a graduate student of Gordon Gallup who studied chimpanzees, mirror self-recognition, and then later came along, uh, I mean, does the chimpanzee have a theory of mind? And then, of course, your paper, does the autistic child have a theory of mind? Do you think there's any relationship between mirror self-recognition or maybe not mirror self-recognition, but sort of the development of a capacity for recognizing yourself in the development of theory of mind? Yeah, and it's a, it's a very um, it's a very topical area at the moment. Uh, the the relationship between imagining someone else's mind and being able to think about your own mind, uh, and there's some evidence that if you have difficulties with one, you'll also have difficulties with the other. So people with autism not only have trouble keeping track of what someone else might think, but also have so-called alexithymia which is all about being able to think about your own mental states, your own emotions, for example, and uh, describe them. So one and the same capacity may be involved in self-reflection as well as reflecting on others. But, you know, Gordon Gallup's work was, was seminal. And uh, actually back in uh, my own PhD, I used that mirror self-recognition test, the little red dot on uh -huh. the forehead, uh, with kids with autism yeah, yeah. and uh, you know just because I was interested in whether they had a concept of their physical self even if they had difficulties in self-reflection in terms of thinking about minds their own mind or someone else's and actually the kids with autism did pass the the mirror test mm. so you know one way to interpret that is that they they have a good understanding of physics mm -hmm. The reflective surfaces of, you know, of mirrors, and uh, you know they have a concept of themselves as a physical object and distinct from other people. Yeah, yeah, so, that's very interesting. Um, with respect to your your research on autism, and and, I, and I'm a big fan. I have to say, this is awesome chatting with you. Um, and uh, you've come up with the idea of the extreme male brain, and and I, I think it's a I think it's it's a good idea. But what people have asked me when I teach them about this in my classes is what about the other side of the equation, the extreme empathizer, right? The extreme systemizer, extreme male brain, it, you know, it, when you play out all the data and all the theory, it, it makes sense. And um, what about the extreme female brain? Is that what we're going to see on the other side of this, this empathizing, systemizing quotient? Sure. Well, if you, um, if you set up the model uh, of empathy along one dimension and systemizing along the other, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the, the mirror image of, of autism would be somebody who has uh, difficulties with uh, systems like math and uh, physics, computer science, uh, but who may be highly empathic. Mm. So it's all, it's all about the, the dissociation between these two dimensions. And, you know, we know less about people at that end of the continuum. We know that they do exist because when you do these population studies, you can see people right along that diagonal. Mm. And, uh, so there are people up there at that, you know, in that space, but they've been, they've been less well researched. And uh, that may be because they don't come to clinical attention. Mm. If you've got very good empathy, you don't end up necessarily in a clinic. Uh, in fact, you may, it may be very protective uh, that good empathy means that you can create your social networks very easily, so you end up with the benefits of social support. And uh, and if and if you have trouble systemizing, uh, I guess you know you just avoid certain subjects at school or at work. Um, so, you know, I think I think I would really encourage more research into that uh, that group. I th I, there's a uh, colleague of mine. Her name is Jennifer Bremser. She is. Uh at a small college in, I think, New York State, maybe Michigan, and she's um, she's postulated. I don't think she's published anything yet that um, women with anorexia nervosa or eating disorders might be the other end of that continuum. 
And I'm, I'm not certain of the details of that argument, but it's, it's interesting to think about. And it's really interesting to think that those individuals have not been well studied. It's obviously, if there's any graduate students who watch this, I mean, this is a great avenue, right, to, to get after. Do you yeah. notice in those population studies that the individuals on that diagonal tend to be more female than male? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, so, so, we, so if you just use those questionnaires you mentioned, mm -hmm. the M quotient, the systemizing quotient, mm -hmm. Uh, if you look for people who score high on the EQ and uh, who score low on the SQ, they tend to be uh, female. And you know, we have to be careful about generalizations here, but just statistically, more likely to be female at that end. Uh, but, you know, people have speculated about whether uh, someone with that profile uh, would have a particular diagnosis, like anorexia, as you mentioned, um, other people have speculated about schizophrenia or about depression. Okay. I would I would say that at, you know at the moment all of these are just speculations, okay. and what we, we we need more research. Okay, excellent. I'm going to change gears now. As interesting as that topic is, and I, I would like it um, for you to tell our listeners a little bit about um, a new endeavor that you've undertaken in the topic of evil. Um, you've written a new book on evil. Which apparently has two titles, one for the, one for America and one for the UK. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you could tell us how you became interested in this topic, uh, evil, and 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 what you're doing research-wise. Sure. Uh, so the title of the book in the UK is Zero Degrees of Empathy, right. um, and uh, my North American publisher wanted a different title. And so with a bit of discussion, we came up with The Science of Evil. Yeah. But basically, the, the book deals with uh, empathy. What is empathy? And once you start thinking about empathy on a spectrum, degrees of empathy, what happens when you go all the way down to zero? And uh, what, what is it that people become capable of once empathy is not available? So the book looks at a, a number of clinical conditions, mostly the personality disorders, like psychopaths, uh, but also borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder. And it looks at the, at the brain basis of empathy. Uh, so uncovering what, uh, what I call in the book the empathy circuit, mm -hmm. which is a, a network of regions in the brain which enable empathy. And, you know, the link with uh, so-called evil is that um, for some people, uh, when empathy isn't available, they become capable of cruelty. So it's a new look at cruelty to try and understand it from the perspective of neuroscience. Uh, but it, it's quite important to, um, to distinguish between people that um, have low empathy and go on to commit acts of cruelty and we do see that, for example, in psychopaths. Uh, as compared to people who have difficulties with empathy, but don't hurt other people, they simply avoid other people. Hmm. And we see that in the case of autism. So I'm, I'm very interested in the consequences of low empathy and how it can have very different outcomes. And the clue that we have is that empathy isn't a single uh, construct. It's a sort of umbrella construct which uh, contains different components. And one part of empathy is the cognitive part, which overlaps with theory of mind. Um, the other component of empathy is the affective part, uh, the emotional reaction you have to somebody else's state of mind. And it looks like in, uh, in psychopaths and people with autism, again, we're looking at a dissociation that psychopaths can have very good cognitive empathy, which is how they can deceive other people, but they have um, very little affective empathy. They don't seem to care about other people. Mm. Whereas in autism, we see the opposite profile, that people with autism struggle to, uh, to, to, to develop cognitive empathy or theory of mind. But if they hear that somebody else is in distress, it does move them. They do, they do care about it. And... They're often the first people to stand up against injustice or want to help another person who's suffering. So it looks like affective empathy is intact in people with autism.
Hmm. And it, it, it may explain why they have very different clinical outcomes. That's fascinating. So um, I, I once heard uh, somebody give a lecture, and their name is escaping me right now, that it's not that psychopaths, and this is what I think you're saying, is that not that psychopaths have no empathy. It's just that their empathy is broken. And that has always made a lot of sense to me because it seems like to be able to be cruel either to another human being or an animal, to, to, to relish in that cruelty, you almost have to have an empathy that's broken. That is, to be, say, to, to come home and kick your dog or something because you like kicking dogs and you don't get anything out of that, that's not empathy. That's, that's something else. But if you relish in that cruelty as, as sociopaths appear to, there, yeah. there is some sense of broken empathy going on. Yeah, um, certainly when you when you use fMRI, um, functional magnetic resonance imaging, you can see parts of the empathy circuit are underactive in mm. psychopaths or people with antisocial personality disorder. Um, you know, and I think you're you're introducing an extra element, which is the idea that people might even get pleasure out of somebody else's pain. So it's not just that their empathy is not functioning at the normal level but they're actually even getting some reward out mm -hmm. of other people's suffering. And that's quite a complex one to explain. I think um, what I was pointing out was that in psychopaths, it's not that the whole of empathy is broken, to use your word, uh -huh. but it seems to be selectively affective empathy, which is that just that capacity to have an appropriate emotional reaction to someone else's, someone else's state of mind. Uh, for example wanting to alleviate somebody else's distress if they're suffering. Mm. And people with autism do show that. So it's a very important distinction that just because you have difficulties with empathy, it doesn't always lead to cruelty. In the case of autism, it often leads to avoiding other people or just finding it very hard to make friends. And people with autism, they're con you know, for them, the consequence is often loneliness or isolation, but not cruelty. Excellent. So, is this work on evil and this this uh, variability in 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 uh, affective versus cognitive empathy? Does this present a new uh, a new dimension on your empathizing systemizing quotient? Is this a sort of like the Z axis? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure whether it can easily map into just those two dimensions. So okay. maybe. Maybe you're right. Maybe we need a third. Uh, but it, I think it's also just reminding us that empathy is a very broad construct. We need to fractionate it. Look at look at the component parts. So I sort of see, you know, empathy is a useful term, a bit like language. You know, we can, talk, we can talk about language or we can talk about memory, but these are very overarching constructs. And that once you start investigating language, you have to break it down into different subsystems syntax, semantics, phonology, and same with memory, different kinds of memory for, for faces or memory for words or short or long term. Mm -hmm. So empathy is also, it, it's, you know, we need to start breaking it down into its component parts. Excellent. Well, Simon, thank you very much for being with me. And um, once the uh, podcast is up on the magazine, I'll send you the link. That's been great. I've, I've enjoyed talking to you. Oh, ditto.